what we've been doing is focusing our attention on how doctors learn about diseases and how they store them in these packets of information known as illness scripts. And they use those illness scripts to help them prioritize a differential diagnosis for a patient. Now we're going to turn our attention more to the patient side of the equation and understand how doctors start with the patient information and arrive at that set of differential diagnoses that they use their illness scripts to prioritize. And then we'll try to begin to put it all together for you um, at this module and in subsequent modules. So our new concepts in module two, building on the concepts we introduced in module one, will be to focus on methods of clinical problem solving and contrast how they differ between novices and experts. And importantly, to learn about a new skill and a new uh, piece of language today, and that's the word processing. Processing is the building block to good problem representation, and we'll spend a lot of time working, working on processing today. Let's talk some more about Sophia Bulara, who was one of our patients from last week. Sophia, as you might recall, is a 17-year-old woman who has a complaint of difficulty walking and leg pain for two days. And we're going to give you more information about her history today. She also has felt tired and feverish for about four days, but she attributed the fatigue um, to soccer practice and to the stress of college applications. She remembers one question about an unusually painful elbow three days ago that resolved on its own, and then some vague wrist aching and redness. She also notes some spots on her hand, but her major complaint today is that leg pain. She's a high school soccer player, and she leads camping trips. She's, much, uh, she's very much interested in the outdoors. She also has asthma that's well controlled on her current medical regimen. She's sexually active with one male partner using birth control pills, and she's currently on her period. This is Sophia's rash. You can see redness there and a little bit close up there. She has similar spots around her ankles and on her other hand. Sophia also has a fever. Her temperature is 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Her heart rate is slightly elevated at 102, and she's got a normal blood pressure for age with a normal respiratory rate. She does, however, appear mildly ill, um, more so than our last patient. And her skin shows these isolated, what we would call hemorrhagic, meaning it's got a bloody appearance, pustules with some inflammation scattered on her hands and lower legs. They don't blanch when you press on them. Her right wrist is red, warm, and tender to the touch, and it hurts when you move it around. Both Achilles tendons are red, warm, and tender to the touch as well. The left seems to me much worse than the right. And the left ankle is warm and red and painful again to range of motion testing. Her elbows, although she complained about them for a few days ago, appear normal today. Now, symptoms are like puzzle pieces, and patients bring us a single puzzle piece and expect us in a period of time, usually 10 or 15 minutes in an office visit, somewhat longer in the hospital, to find out which puzzle that puzzle piece fits into. But good not diagnosticians understand that puzzle pieces are not unique. Puzzle pieces of joint pain could fit in a number of different puzzles very well. It could fit in a puzzle of Lyme disease, of gout, of tendinitis, of lupus. And it's up to us to figure out what features do we need to search for to figure out which puzzle is the right one for us to pursue to explain Sophia's joint pain. All clinicians who take care of patients have three tools in their clinical problem solving toolbox, and they use them in different aspects and with different frequencies. The first is hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is the linking of a single symptom or sign to a list of possible diagnoses, um, and then working through that list of possible diagnoses to see whether or not the patient might have additional features that would support um, that particular disease as the cause of their signs or symptoms. It is the form of problem solving that is taught a great deal in medical schools and also serves as the basis for many medical textbooks. For instance, you can see a chart in a medical textbook that says the symptom of shortness of breath or dyspnea might be caused by 50 different diseases. In hypothesis testing, the clinician will look at that list and will sequentially work their way down the list each time returning back to the patient to see if they have more signs or symptoms that might, they might add to that first one to support 
the identification of that disease as the cause of their problem. Because the symptoms um, generate a list and then the clinician uses that list to go back to the patient to find more information, this is sometimes called backward thinking. In contrast, forward thinking is the use of a branch chain algorithm to sequentially narrow the set of differential diagnoses that are considered by accumulating more and more precise information about the patient's initial complaint. So for example, if a patient presents with low platelets, in forward thinking, the clinician would be asking themselves before they start looking at the differential diagnosis list, well, if there are low platelets, is that due to a decrease in production or an increase in destruction? And if it's due to an increase in destruction, is that associated with a coagulopathy or not associated with a coagulopathy? And if it's associated with a coagulopathy, is it associated with other symptoms or signs like fever or confusion or not associated? So you can see them work their way through this branch chain either or sequence of questions. And in doing so, they are refining and decreasing the number of differential diagnoses they need to consider before identifying one uh, that they want to narrow down and focus in on. The third form of clinical problem solving is known as pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is often referred to as the ant mini form of clinical problem solving. When you see an older woman walking down the street, she's got perhaps blue hair and orthopedic shoes, you don't ask yourself, rule out Aunt Joan or rule out Grandma. You say, I recognize that person to be Aunt Minnie. So pattern recognition is the instantaneous or near instantaneous recognition that all key and differentiating elements of a given disease are present in a patient. And therefore, that must be the right diagnosis. Now, some people think that this is intellectually lazy, um, but in fact, many experts spend most of their time in clinical problem solving in a pattern recognition mode. And they do so because they've earned the right to do this by developing very robust illness scripts and compare and contrast thinking. So let's look at all of these a little bit more closely. So here's Sophia again. And we're going to approach her problem as we would if we were using hypothesis testing for our clinical problem solving strategy. We would focus on one symptom, leg pain. And in general, it's one or perhaps two. And then generate a, a differential diagnosis list of the things that could cause leg pain. That might include deep venous thrombosis, sprained ankle, lupus, cellulitis, shin splints, Osgood-Schlatter syndrome, sciatica, rheumatic fever or gout. And you can see from this list, the person who generated the list is probably considering some of the elements that are present in Sophia's uh, history, just not explicitly so. So they might be remembering that she was taking oral contraceptives and thinking DVT might be relevant. And she's a young woman, so lupus might be relevant. Now in hypothesis testing, that single or few symptoms is linked to that large and comprehensive list of possible diagnoses. And I, as a clinical problem solver, using hypothesis testing would work through each diagnosis in turn, going back to the patient to ask if other signs and symptoms relevant to the diagnosis under consideration are present. And if I couldn't find more symptoms to match that new diagnosis, I'd move on to the next disease and start over again asking more questions about what possible symptoms might be present. So I'd start with DVT, and I'd go back to Sophia and I'd say, well, is there swelling just on one side? No. Do you use birth control pills? Yes. Have you had any recent immobilization? No. Do you have any shortness of breath? No. Does the pain improve with rest? No. Does the swelling? Nope. Well, there's only one feature here. I don't think that's going to match, so I'm not going to consider that anymore. And I'm going to go to diagnosis number two on my list, which was lupus. And again, work my way through a series of questions to see if there are anything else in my lupus folder, remembering the way novices store their information, that might suggest that this person has lupus. And if not, I'm going to keep going down the list until I find the right diagnosis or me and or the patient are too tired to keep going on. Now, hypothesis testing, even though it works at times, has a lot of cons to it. The single symptom triggered lists are very long, and that often 
precipitates some redundant data gathering. Those of you who are watching who are faculty can recognize when people are using hypothesis testing because they ask the same question over and over and over again. For instance, in a patient with shortness of breath, they will ask the patient when considering the diagnosis of pneumonia, uh, do you have cough? And if they, if they discard the possible diagnosis of pneumonia, they'll move on to the subsequent condition. And if that condition also includes cough in the signs and symptoms, they'll ask the question about cough again. It's not that they've forgotten the patient didn't have cough. It's that they are asking the questions in the way in which they learn the disease. And that redundant data gathering is problematic for the patient and also for the student or clinical problem solver who now is keeping track of more information than they need to. If the patient has multiple symptoms, um, this hypothesis testing process is often repeated with multiple lists. So if the patient has a symptom of joint pain, they'll do a diagnostic list for joint pain. If they also have shortness of breath, they'll do a separate list for shortness of breath and try and work their way through both and see where there might be some overlap. Alternatively, they may just ignore that second symptom because they are spending too much time on the first one. Most importantly, hypothesis testing is very intellectually taxing, uh, both for the clinician and for the patient. So there's a really strong tendency to accept what I've called a good enough fit. When you get to diagnosis number seven or number eight, you're getting tired and your brain will in some ways just sort of say, you know what, I think there's enough features here to make this the right diagnosis, um, simply because um, your cognitive ability has been, has been sort of eliminated through the very sequential work through this hard list of diagnoses. But it can be helpful if the right diagnosis is on the list at the beginning and, as I said, both the physician and the patient have the stamina to work through it. It's also useful if other forms of problem solving don't work, particularly in novel situations. Even experts will use hypothesis testing when they're faced with a patient who simply doesn't get better on treatment for a disease they thought they had or if there are new um, diseases that have developed and no one's quite aware of what the true condition is. How do people arrive at the list from this hypothesis testing? How do they go from the leg pain that Sophia is exhibiting to a list that they can then work through um, in a backward thinking mode um, for any clinician? Well, there are certainly published lists. As I mentioned, many textbooks are organized in this way and will, um, in parts of the textbook, give you lists of symptom-driven possible differential diagnoses, and there are lots of online sites that you can go to and patients may have gone to. People also have personal lists that are based on their pre personal experience. And these are highly subject to availability heuristic. Now, a heuristic is a rule of thumb, uh, a way of exploring via trial and error. Uh, and the problem with these personal lists is things that you have seen frequently and commonly jump up to the top of the list and you are more predisposed to diagnosing a condition if you, today if you diagnosed that condition last week. And then there's this third phenomena which many third year medical students are well aware of and that's what I've called the category chase. And this is a mnemonic that reminds you to consider different mechanistic causes of the symptom in front of you. There are many, many of these published and many have their own personal one. Um, I'm just going to illustrate for you this one called I Vindicate. Um, you're supposed to take the symptom, like Sophia's leg pain, and say, could it be idiopathic? What diseases cause idiopathic leg pain? Could it be vascular? What kind of vascular problems? And we had one on our list, DVT. Could it be iatrogenic? Is there something a doctor did um, to cause this pain? Could it be a cancer? Could it be degenerative? Could it be infectious? Could it be congenital, autoimmune, trauma, endocrine? And generate a list, again, uh, with the order of the list not related to how likely the diagnosis is based on the patient's condition, but where it falls in this mnemonic, I vindicate. So let's start with a quiz. Hypothesis testing is one, efficient, two, sometimes known as forward thinking, three, the form of problem solving preferred by experts, or four, potentially effective but time consuming. And the answer is, potentially effective but time-consuming. The form of problem-solving preferred by experts is pattern recognition. Hypothesis testing is known as backward thinking. And hypothesis testing may be effective, but it is rarely efficient.